Just think about it. In the last 10 years, things that you are probably using now that did not exist in 1999. There were no Google AdWords. There were no iPhones. By the way, NUS Enterprise came to Silicon Valley in 2001, 2002. LinkedIn didn't exist until 2002. MySpace a year later. Google did its IPO. Then there was YouTube and Google Earth and Facebook all in 2005. That was a big year. It was also a year, remember when Qualcomm said that he came back to the valley? He brought some good luck with him when he came back in 2005. In 2006, we had Twitter and uh, SlideShare, so the place that you're going to be able to get your slides from tonight. 2007, a pretty big year with both the iPhone, Gmail, and Mint uh, coming onto the market at the same year. 2008, I looked for two days to try to find a really good Silicon Valley innovation that came in 2008, and I couldn't find one. So if somebody knows of one that you think is really fantastic and happy that you please let me know and I'll change the slide. But the thing that 2008 was most known for, other than the meltdown of the financial institutions, which was happening not in Silicon Valley, but in New York City and so on, was that Sequoia Capital had a very dour doomsday meeting with all of the, uh, the presidents and CEOs and founders of its portfolio companies and said, rest in peace, good times. And they said, basically, in the course of a very brutal slide deck, that um, the entrepreneurs were going to have to live with less and find ways to cut costs because it was going to be a long, hard start before things got better in terms of the economy. 2009 got a little bit nicer with Farmville. Anybody play Farmville in the other? A few of you are laughing, very few people putting their hands up. Okay. And 2010 is still early, but certainly um, Google is trying to uh, tell Apple that it really has its hands full, hands full right now, and they're coming after Apple in the mobile space, so we'll see where that goes. So that's some examples, and just think about this. Ten years ago, none of this stuff was here, but many of us are using many of these innovations in ways that have really made our lives a lot easier. That's just in mobile and uh, what you've got on, it's just the tip of the iceberg. In clean tech, at the same time, starting in Roughly 2004 or five, there was not very much venture investing in clean tech prior to that. But things really started to pick up in 2004 and five. These six categories of air, air water and waste, energy efficiency, green building, renewable energy, smart power, smart grid, energy storage and transportation, are the categories that are used by the largest business plan competition in the United States for clean tech. And the name of that uh, competition is Clean Tech Open. We would love if any of you have an idea for a clean tech venture that you participate in Clean Tech Open this year. You do not have to be in the United States to do it. You can enter the competition. And um, should you enter the competition, you could become a semi-finalist and you could come up for a weekend during the summer and meet with another 100 or 150 startups and then be helped to get ready to present to venture investors in the course of the fall, and they'll have in November the grand winners will be announced. So, if any of you are interested in clean tech and you've got a venture that's um, part way along, you can certainly go to Clean Tech Open and participate uh, even from here. And Clean Tech Open founders see Singapore as the logical place where that they would use as a base as they expanded to Asia. They're not going to do that in 2010 in a formal way, but we hope to see them here in 2011. So that's the good news. You've got a lot of really good things that are happening in this last decade, despite a pretty nasty overall economy in 2008 and 9, and a very bad economy in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. So it was not a particularly super decade in terms of the world economy, but we had some good areas of growth. This. And um, again, I want to thank Lawrence for the, for the graphics, which I could not have done without his help. This shows the billions of dollars that the venture capital community has invested in Silicon Valley, all the way from 1995. And what it's showing here in 2008 and 2009 is the results of this problem with the meltdown of the, um, of the investment banks 
in 2008. I'm going to explain a little bit about why that happened, but the problem when this when this pattern emerges is there's actually scarcity in the land of Plymouth. By that I mean, even though you know seven or eight billion dollars being pumped into the Silicon Valley community seems like a ton of money compared to earlier years. It's not as much, and there are very capital-intensive industries that are trying to get launched with clean energy, clean air, and clean water. So that money doesn't go as far when you've got energy-related and water-related ventures. They actually need more capital, and so there's a little bit of a capital starvation going on. Let's look at why that's happening. And I was trying to have something that looked like a double vice, so you're getting squeezed from both sides and then squeezed from the top and the bottom. There are four main reasons that venture capital is getting crunched in the valley. The first is that many funds that raised money at the peak in the year 2000, and when, when you had all that money going into the valley, had very bad economic performance on the things that they invested in in 2001, two, and three. So because of that, then the people who are the limited partners or LPs don't really want to put more money into venture capital funds because the returns were not very good in the last 10 years compared with, say, the 1990s when there were very good returns. A second major problem is if you're running a pension fund or say you're a university that has an endowment that you can put a little bit of your money into private equity or venture capital, that percent is a ratio, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small percent, maybe one or two or three percent of the total amount that you would have invested in different things. But with the meltdown of the capital markets because of the, um, the mortgage um, fiasco, the value of everybody's other investments went down, went way down, and as a result, if you can only have two percent in venture capital, the amount you could put into venture capital was less because the value of all your other investments went down. Does that make sense? So if you, let's imagine you had um, uh, $500 million and you could invest 1% of it, which would be 5 million, in VC or say 2%, 10 million. If in fact your $500 million drops to 300 million because of the meltdown, you have less money you can put into VC. So that's the second major reason that there's less, the VC funds, firms can't raise uh, funds the, these years as easily as they could in the past. A third reason is because the investment banks are in great disarray, there are fewer people available to help you either to go public, if the company is ready to go public, or to be bought or sold, but to be bought by another company if you're going to do a trade sale, through mergers and acquisitions. And finally, uh, particularly in the United States, there are a lot of very cranky people who used to invest in the stock market, who used to look forward to having a new company go public and say, well, yeah, I'll buy some of that, I'll buy some Yahoo, or I'll buy a little Google stock, why not? And these days they're going, we hate business. Business people are evil. <laughs> Look what they did. They did all these things with the, with the mortgages and they created this terrible, terrible economic mess. And so they don't trust the investment bankers or the securities firms or anybody else who's trying to sell them stock. And as a result, it's a lot harder to have, have an initial public offering. And the value of the other companies that could be doing mergers and acquisitions by using their stock to buy other little companies, the value of their stock's not as high as they can do as much M&A. Long story short, there's less money going into venture capital firms, and so there's less money coming out. Now we're going to talk, we're going to let you hear from Ron Conway, pull this up here, who's um, one of the best known angel investors, so I hope the audio will be okay here, and he's, he's talking about how many companies try to get money from him as an angel investor relative to the numbers that he actually takes. And the VCs are even more selective than Ron Conway is. So as you listen to this, think about um, how difficult it might be to get on his assembly.